Okay, I think I think we're on. Great. All right. Howdy doody, Craig. Good to see you again. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be back. <laughs> now, of course, uh, for those who aren't familiar with you yet, do you want to just give a little intro for yourself? I know you're used to doing this uh, many times, but uh, yeah, feel free to introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, well, basically, I'm a perpetual academic. Uh, I keep studying and um, uh, very glad to have been accepted for another doctorate at CNAM because otherwise I'd have to be yes. a normal person and get <laughs> out of uni yep. uh, because the University of London's decided that they're going to kick me out because um, they've figured out that I've done all my required courses and um, I was signing up but this year I went to sign up again and they've gone um, uh, well no you can't you, you've got to graduate what so, is that wait wait well what yeah, it seems like yeah, you keep uh, yeah, running into this, this issue. Is there actually a limit to how many degrees and doctorates you can get? Uh, most universities get really narky after your second one, I've found. Uh, huh. But even then, if you've got a master's degree um, and, a, and a doctorate and there's any overlap, they find, you find it difficult. But um, uh, one of them told me I should go out there and, and get a real job, basically. Um, I already got the haircut, so. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, and, yeah, for obviously, for, for, for those who aren't uh, familiar, I guess, uh, with your background and your involvement in cryptocurrencies, uh, when did you first get involved with this world? And how did you get involved? When I first got involved um, with this world uh, was <laughs> in the 90s with... Uh, uh, Actually, Mark Twain Bank, if anyone ever remembers that one. Ooh. That, that's a long way back. Yeah, <laughs> that is a long way back. Um, so that, and okay, so in terms of your evolution of, uh, I guess, yeah, your career history, all right, how did that lead up to, what's the time period? Uh, it's about 2008, 2009. What was happening uh, then and, that, and then? I've been involved with information security basically forever. Uh, mm. Back in the 90s, I was doing this. I started uh, running a whole lot of IT stuff for a company called Aussie Mail, which was a big exchange back in Australia. Yeah. Um, funny enough, the PM was my uh, direct boss. He, I mean, I, this is back in the early days before he was really rich. Yeah. Uh, um, back then, he was uh, sort of the head of... Uh, Aussie Mail, he'd started it from his publishing company. Mm. Um, it was a handle, uh, a nightmare basically, because um, <laughs> he came from a traditional publishing background and uh, technology, well, it, mm. it took him a while. Yep. <laughs> uh, what can we say? <laughs> anyway, uh, from there, uh, went to the stock exchange. I worked, I mean, um, uh, I ran the um, IT security function in uh, the Australian Stock Exchange, which is now Securities Exchange for a while. Yeah. Uh, that was quite interesting because uh, I'd actually done work in the 80s for Brisbane uh, in, before they merged to become the Australian Stock Exchange. I was with uh, mm. Brisbane Stock Exchange, but totally different. I was a chalky, if anyone knows what the hell that is. That's, what is that's a chalky for those? <laughs> So back before computers, they had uh, this, these guys everyone yelled at writing um, stock quotes. Wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, high pressure, you want to uh, have a whole pile of brokers yelling, screaming, throwing things at you. And, yeah, yeah. Don't get that anymore. It's not quite the same. You don't have a floor anymore in exchanges. It's all electronics. So different world. So just old enough to have seen both. Had had one year of... Uh, uh, just the edge before it all ended. Yeah, wow. Um, and you've got a little bit of influence as well from uh, your, is it your father or your, your grandfather from the military side? Uh, my grandfather was, um, worked with MacArthur. He um, uh, was involved in both Brisbane and, and Melbourne in the um, uh, decoding efforts there as well as um, over in Hut 6 for a little while. Okay, and, wow. Good. Yeah, and and do you feel that that has um, influenced, I guess, yeah, your your current day work in any way, shape, or form? Um, it sort of did. I mean, when I first joined the 
Australian Air Force. I wanted to be a pilot and then got mm. shunted off to um, doing coding and other such things uh, mm. because I could do that. Yep. And if I was a young 17 year old with my own thing, I probably would have totally gone a different way in life, but uh, yeah. it's probably good anyway, but ignore that. Yep. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to weave in obviously a lot of the things that we've, we, we've kind of talked about before, but which I personally feel is uh, pretty, pretty cool to know about you. Um, there's a, a bit of a Japanese influence um, as well for you in terms of, uh, what, what, what you like, uh, where did that come about um, in, in your history, I guess? Like in terms of, yeah, either anime or uh, certain historian, uh, historic characters? Oh, it goes back a long way. I had um, uh, my mother and my father um, divorced when I was young, about five. So mm. um, a a uh, person called Masatasu who's now, he died back in the 90s. Uh, yeah. After World War II, migrated to Australia, uh, emigrated and, um, uh, well, sort of, yeah, was just part of my life. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, I did martial arts for a long time since I was a kid. Wow. Um, nice. nice. What, type which, of what type of martial arts did you, uh, did you practice? Both, uh, well, actually, a, a number. I started on some of the Japanese ones, then went over to Manta style kung fu. Nice. Um, which I don't think people realize that um, there are you know, more grandmasters in Brisbane, Australia, for uh, Tong Long Manta style than there are in China now. Because after what? the purge, uh, well, after the purge, uh, most of the people. Uh, left back in the 1930s and for some reason they ended up in Australia in in Queensland and yeah. there's actually a strong presence of uh, uh, of the tradition there now because of that so weird as that may seem yeah, that's there a are, random yeah <laughs> there's actually more um, sort of history of um, this sort of branch of Shaolin than there is in China anymore because the original Communist Party tried to purge them all so Wow. Yeah, that's uh, your you have a painting in the background. And just one second, I'm just going to close my uh, window because you can hear planes and everything. It gets annoying. Um, yeah. Before uh, I had the pleasure of uh, hearing you talk about that painting in the background. Um, for those who are not familiar with your Twitter handle, well, first, um, what is your Twitter handle uh, represent? Who is that person? And then also the painting in the background, how are those two linked? Oh. <laughs> ask. All right, that's Hieronymus Bosch. Um, basically, that's a depiction of hell from uh, the period of history where um, people were still religious, pseudo religious, and science was awakening in Europe. Mm. What we have is all the depictions as they would see it back then because uh, well, the, the theology of the time was a lot stronger. Mm. Uh, however, uh, as people have opened up throughout Europe, it's changed. My, my handle goes back to uh, Faust, of course. Mm. Um, Professor Faust being, rather than Dr. Faust being teacher Faust. Yeah. That goes back because um, it's... Faust wanted unlimited knowledge. Mm. So I guess, uh, in a way, um, I joined the military when I was partway through university the first time. Mm. Uh, and I finished my first year and I joined in my second year because uh, I was working at night um, as a chef and I was working in the mornings um, actually gutting chickens. Mm. Uh, I didn't have rich parents. So... Um, uh, the military gave, like it does to many people, an opportunity to, well, basically have an education and um, do things for your country and potentially get shot um, <laughs> in exchange for a bit of education. So yeah. um, you can say, in part, my Faustian deal was uh, working for the government for a while to get the start of knowledge that then paid for the rest of my education as I started earning in the rest of my career. Yeah. Wow. 
I mean, that explains a lot why you're, why you're constantly, um, yeah, getting your degrees and you're constantly learning and you're constantly putting knowledge out. Um, are there any downsides to this constant uh, desire for more knowledge? Uh, yes, like everything, you, it becomes an addiction after times so and knowledge itself is an addiction. Yeah. Um, and knowledge isn't power. Knowledge can be used as a lever for power. This mm, is where power. People, um, not even potential. I think mm. one of the problems with many intellectuals is they believe that they need to have more power because they have knowledge. Mm. And, and one of the saddest things for many people is having knowledge without power mm. now knowledge is power but the right knowledge can be powerful and mm. the wrong knowledge can be destructive now that doesn't mean that it's not right to do things as long as you understand what it does mm. um i mean i in one of my um, uh, degrees that i don't generally um, list uh, i did a, um, a another liberal arts degree i studied uh, van eck who's a Dutch master. Um, in particular, I studied many of the Dutch masters, but um, uh, I, I decided to study Van Eck at, the, uh, uh, at that particular time, which was when the Dutch were, well, basically their economy was booming. Mm. The, the money was coming in left, right and center from trade. In particular, the Spanish had um, done exactly the wrong thing and become uber mercantilists yeah. which gold flow i mean it, it was called the reign of silver in spain at the time because as fast as the silver and gold would come into the country it would leave mm. people didn't do anything they just sat there and bought from everywhere else which is why spain's become much of a basket case mm. in the world today they, they lost the attitude of trade mm. and uh, then countries such as uh, uh, the netherlands picked it up and ran with it and now we see uh, an era in their history when they were masters of the universe, so to speak, mm. uh, but because of trade. Yeah, I know. And you've touched on this before in terms of, uh, you know, talks about capitalism, right, and mercantilism. So, you know, why, why do you think, do you think people get it wrong when it comes to uh, capitalism and the, you know, the effects of capitalism on poor parts of the world. And I, I know we've gone through this and its relation to Bitcoin, but um, yeah, well, let's first maybe cover the mercantilism uh, side and then maybe the capitalism side. Mercantilism is the hoarding of wealth. So mm. that goes back, uh, especially with government, into the era where uh, people were being colonized and invaded not so that they could build trade per se, but so they could build trade to collect more bullion. Mm. They have bigger stores back home. Now, there's a reason for that. And mercantilism actually does have its roots in a, a good reason for those people. Mm. Mercantilism was about being able to fund wars. Yeah. So if you're being able to have a bigger treasury, you can hire more soldiers and pay mm. them on time. You can have more mercenaries, you can have more troops, you can have more ships. Mm. And Britain became very, very good at this. Britain yeah. had more ships of the line than any other country. And right up until the last century had the biggest navy in the world. Yeah. Which now it's handed off to the Americans, but uh, for yeah. a long time, um, that's really what it was about. It was about building a national presence. Mm. Now, when they first started many of these endeavors, um, it was actually completely different. It was, uh, for instance, with the um, initial uh, move into India, it started as a trade exercise. Mm. But what they wanted to do was expand more and more. And they started thinking that they needed to teach people to be more British. Yeah. And silly things. And that's when, that's when everything started going wrong. Yeah. So when it was just trade, that was fine. But mm. um, then people had to make the argument that how do we ensure that this will be here in a hundred years time? Mm. Well, there are ways of doing that. One, you can put soldiers there and um, force people mm. and two trade better. Yeah. But that's, that's the problem we have with many companies today. Yeah. Now most business people are not capitalists. Right. Oh, they work explain, for explain. Yeah. Most business people want help. They want to be capitalists until 
they get to the point where there is enough, well, leverage that they can help have government help force them into a position. Mm. They want then regulation to ensure that barriers to entry are difficult enough that they don't need to be competitive anymore. Yes. The problem with capitalism is it's a, I've said this many times, I like Lewis Carroll, it's a red queen game. Mm. You have to keep going faster and faster just to stay still. You mm. can never stop. And what you see with any business over time is it gets to a certain size and then it wants to maintain where it is. Yes, so, so true. The way to maintain is either be uber competitive and keep building and building and building, or you can co-opt government. And by co-opting government, you can start regulations and other things in place that make it difficult for other people to come and compete. Mm. We see this in banks. Uh, it used to be that any man and their dog could set up a bank and you didn't need to worry so much about bank runs because um, anyone knew that if you didn't have enough, you're basically bankrupt. Mm. So people would very quickly take their money out of small banks if they had any inkling of a problem. Mm. So whereas then to stop that, of course, they, they said, well, we should be able to invest more and put more money out there and have lower and lower reserves. Come and help us, Mr. Government, by doing X, Y, and Z. And mm. then, of course, Federal Reserve currency um, protection and interest and everything like that is put on things so that uh, you can't run out of money because we'll just print more. But Yeah. So would you say um, Brexit was a good example of that? Because um, I remember seeing a video, actually, where... Uh, they were talking about like what eventually led to 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 Brexit was this this point of where yeah Britain was finding it hard to compete with other countries that were you know getting their uh, their goods out at a much cheaper price and so then they were relying you know on, on government or EU however you, you want to call that um, I mean are there correlations correlations there. Well, yes, but it's also a little bit short-sighted when you start mm. thinking that you're still going to have to compete either way. Yeah. So if you want to go into sell to the EU or anything else, then you still have to follow those regulations and do their rules. Mm. So like or not, uh, you're going to find that things are difficult here in Britain. Mm. Now, there is a lot of migration, which from any economist will tell you, migration is beautiful for any economic growth or system. Mm. The ability for people to move around the world freely mm. is people have opportunities anywhere in the world. Mm. People can start doing things, learning, developing, um, send money back home to where they are and at the same time help the economy of where they are. Mm. I mean, here in Britain, we have a lot of people from Eastern Europe, for instance. Mm. Now, those people may not be here afterwards and they're not taking British jobs. These yeah. are jobs British don't want to do. So it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen when people are used to all those positions, used to the people who are their cleaners, used to the people who yeah. are the dishwasher. And the British don't want to do this. Mm. I mean, there, there are some British will do it, but as a whole, the country has been benefiting from these low wage migrant workers who then are able to send money back to help their families. Mm. And in, I've, I've spoken to a number of them. Like I, I know a lot of people from Poland mm. and they send money back from, uh, from here to their families and that helps educate their children who then won't need to do the same thing they're doing. Mm. So all of that stops. But at the same time, we sit there saying, oh, but the money won't leave the country. But the money just, we stop trade. Yeah. We stop and people don't seem to think and understand that, for instance, in Africa, mm. Africa is not poor because it's being exploited. Mm. Africa is poor because it's not engaging in trade. Mm. Africa is less than 0.1% of uh, global trade with the US right at the moment. That's yeah. an entire continent. Yeah. There's more trade with a small country like Australia than there is the entirety of Africa. Yeah. Australia with 20 something million people and a huge area uh, mm. that is still only a, a quarter or so of Africa mm. 
compared to over a billion people and by 2030, 2040, maybe 1.5 to 1.6 billion people mm. and they're just not trading. Mm. If that market's opened up and people are allowed to be able to actually engage in the world, that's mm. going to be a phenomenal change globally. And yeah. I know some people don't like the idea of losing hegemony, but the reality is you don't need hegemony if you have free trade. Yeah. And so I guess that's a good segue into the case for Bitcoin, right? Because I know you're passionate about um, Bitcoin being for the entire world, not just the West, not just for those who um, earn a decent wage, right? You know, we're looking at people who may even earn less than $2. And we've had some <laughs> interesting conversations on Twitter um, around that. But, you know, how do you see, um, you know, folks in the poor parts of the world, right, using something like Bitcoin? And how do you see that um, helping to lift themselves up uh, compared to what's, you know, what may be limiting them right now uh, with the, the current uh, regulations and, and, and fiat currencies that are, you know, very much nation based? So I've spent a little bit of time in places like Mumbai in India. Uh, yep. Even the Congo, whatever, I'm not sure what they call themselves today. The yeah. Through some changes. Uh, yeah. uh, South, uh, South Saharan Africa and other places. And even um, uh, certain areas like Venezuela and things like this. And mm. what you see when you travel around is different ways of trying to save money. These are people who are either unbanked or underbanked. And when you, when you go to underbanked, it's even worse. People who need to live on payday loans and things like this, all sorts of problems. Now, in many cases, the way that they save is very interesting and innovative. Uh, one of my favorites that I saw in, um, when I was in Ghana was watching people build houses. Um, what would happen would they'd get a, a bit of money in either from seasonal work or from when they're overseas mm. and they would buy bricks and mortar and they would build more of a room. And this could go on for 20 years. Wow. And at the end of the time, um, they would have a full house and then that's their value. That's what they can actually store and, and negotiate and things like this. Mm. And the value comes only when it's complete. They can't wow. sell it. They can't sell it partially, so they have to complete it to be able to sell it. Mm. They, uh, they can't easily move around and do anything um, other than uh, they can't resell the bricks or anything easily because yeah. bricks out and having secondhand ones aren't quite the same. So it gives them a long-term savings. So they can send some of the money back to their, their wives and family, and some can be saved. And it's a long-term way of paying for their children and things like this. Mm. Now, it's still small. I mean, it's not um, anything grand like anyone. I mean, um, even a McMansion in, in the West or something like that is hundreds of times sort of more than yeah. what they have. Yet. Um, it's a way of saving a little bit over many years. Now, the problem there is it's not a good emergency stash for them. If something goes wrong and it's not a good disaster stash because when things go wrong, uh, like when I was in, um, I, I saw some of the fires and floods and things like this in my time in Mumbai. And I saw people walking around in the slums, but everything had been basically wrecked. So that's their life savings gone. And when we look at this, these same people had mobile phones. I know that sounds strange to people in the West. <laughs> yeah, this but not, yeah. <laughs> they interact and do things. It's their lifeline. So we're not talking a modern, um, like I have S8 or something like this. It'll be an old one. So uh, people don't know, don't seem to understand that when you have those phone collection banks and you dump and recycle your old phone. That can be some, some of the places it goes to. People refresh it a little bit and it gets sold off to Africa or India. And yeah, yeah that, that helping these people. I mean, yeah. for people on $2 a day, yes, they have a, a mobile phone and they charge it 
um, there are businesses who run charging stations and all sorts of things over there. And uh, amazingly enough, um, these people you would think wouldn't have internet, have internet. It might be slow, it might be cumbersome, it might be something like out of the 80s, uh, but uh, it still manages the work. Yeah, you know, and I think this goes back again um, to some of those Twitter conversations or threads that, you know, uh, we were a part of, um, you know, the CEO for Blockstream uh, was making uh, a statement about, you know, those less than $2 not being computer literate enough for, you know, what are they going to do essentially with Bitcoin? And it, it was interesting to see because, you know, there was folks like uh, yourself, um, Vinny Lingham, founder of Civic, uh, myself, you know, if you've lived outside of just the one country that you were raised in, like, you know, that is a reality that we are aware of that. And, you know, all of this talk, um, it's amazing to see how that draws out, uh, I guess, the things that people just simply are not aware of. You know, um, I, I gave an example of how when, for my senior year project, uh, I, I, I had to do a thesis paper as if I was, you know, in college. And I did it on the digital divide for the rural poor in Bangladesh. And even I was surprised to learn, you know, how the rural poor had completely leapfrogged from nothing to mobile phones, right? Yeah. And, th and there was a great story um, where one of the uh, NGOs, uh, the father of one of my friends, he was saying that he brought in a villager into his house one time and uh, he was talking to him about his experiences with the mobile phones and then uh, the te a telephone rang, <laughs> right? You know, that was connected to the wall. And then when the telephone rang, uh, the villager looked over at the, at the phone and asked, why is, your, why is your phone connected to the wall? He couldn't understand why, you know, there was a landline connecting the phone to the wall. And, you know, definitely, and that was back when, you know, early 2000s, you know, and it's, it amazes me still that like 17 years later, a lot of people in the West um, who have all their this technology still don't even know that or realize that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, again, you know, with, uh, from, from the Bitcoin side, um, what do you see happening next? You know, right now, uh, there's regulations coming in, right? Uh, the, I think it was either today or Friday, the U.S. is definitely um, yes, warning people. And I think Indonesia was also warning people that the regulations are coming. Um, I know that you know this has been coming for a while. <laughs> what do you think is going to be happening, uh, happening next, or at least in 2018, around the regulatory side? Oh, like it or not, governments are going to step in. Yep. And uh, we're going to help ensure that that is as smooth and simple as possible mm. uh, so that we can have Bitcoin Cash grow and flourish. Mm. Now, one of the problems, I mean, going back to what you said before, um, like with um, Samson Mao, yeah. it's incredibly paternalistic mm. to sit there in America um, or can, um, Canada or whatever else and tell people what they can and cannot do is the exact opposite of what Bitcoin is designed for. Mm. It's about freedom. Telling people how they have to engage, that they can't do things unless it's your way, is just wrong. Yeah. There's no other way to put it. Mm. I mean, the reality is these, these are people who should be able to do anything they want on this. And forcing them off because you don't think it's right for them. These are people who use WhatsApp, which is as complex as um, anything yeah. that Bitcoin needs to be. If you want to say that Bitcoin's too complex, then quite frankly, make the UI simpler. Yes. And getting into that, that's going to happen next year. Mm. So next year, we're going to see um, finally some simple UIs coming out. Yeah. We're going to see it simple and social. We're, we're going to have it so that people don't need to understand how Bitcoin works to know how to work Bitcoin. Yeah. And we're going to grow and scale this. So um, there's going to be a lot of a push in Africa. There's going to be a lot of push in, in a lot of other places. And if Samson and others don't want these people, we do. Yeah. We want those billion and a half people in Africa. And we want those billion people in India mm. and all the other parts of Asia, Bangladesh, China, uh, everywhere else. 
we want those other 2 billion people mm. and we want South America. And quite frankly, um, if Bitcoin thinks it's a bank alternative, mm. a settlement layer, mm. they got something coming because it is crap at old technology. It's mm. brilliant at replacing it and disrupting it, mm. but it is the worst, most horrible settlement system for existing banking ever. Mm. And if you think otherwise, you have no idea how banking works, yeah. quite frankly. Yeah. So you can't shoehorn Bitcoin into banking. You have to basically shoehorn banking into Bitcoin. Yeah. And if you don't get that, then you failed. Yeah. The end. And now, of course, uh, we have kind of, you know, we're, we're bouncing around to different uh, topics, which, you know, I actually love. Uh, but for those who are not familiar with Bitcoin Cash, you know, say it's uh, someone completely new to uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrencies. Uh, can you just give a little uh, lowdown of uh, the difference between Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin um, when it was birthed and why? Okay. The reason why goes back to um, two points. One, refusing to scale, which was a really big issue. Mm. And two, segregated witness. Yeah. Number one is important in that if people had been willing to sort of compete fairly, we probably wouldn't have had the divide. And that would be allowing scaling. Yeah. Right now, every major altcoin exists because they were forced away from Bitcoin. Ethereum exists because um, people limited the opcodes um, and, and put limitations that weren't originally there. Rather than fixing the opcodes, they decided to take them out. Oh, it's not good enough, etc. Um, and made false analogies of why they're, they're wrong. Now, an example is uh, I've seen some of the main, main core developers complain about um, op2 mult and uh, 2mul. Now, that allows you to double the value. And their comment is um, on some of the Bitcoin talk forums how dangerous that could be because you could just double and overflow values because you could go up to malt, up to malt, up to malt. And like the old um, chessboard bit, after a number of doublings, it's so close to infinite, it's not funny. Mm. Although it's not, infinite, of course, I mean, but it's bigger than any computer will handle. Now, here's the thing. I can do up add, up dupe, up add, up dupe, up add, up dupe. And by um, duplicating, I go one, one, two, 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 four. Mm. But so I can do the same so-called attack if I wanted to, and I can do it with allowed opcodes. So as soon as you start looking at that, you realize that this argument is BS designed to basically fulfill the ideas of people who don't know as much and stop them knowing anything about this and just shut it down. So what we're going to do is we're going to, in the new year, fix all those opcodes and get Bitcoin to where it was going to be originally. So that the original use case, why Ethereum split off Bitcoin is gone. We're mm -hmm. going to enable all that and allow all the tokenization and everything that uh, people like Luke Jr. called spam back on Bitcoin because mm. it's something that is valuable. Uh, valuable. If you pay for a service, it's not spam. See, even in email, spam was unsolicited commercial email. Mm. If you pay someone and I send you a dollar and you take that dollar and that's to watch an ad, then it's not unsolicited anymore. So, yeah. sorry. Now, on top of that, allowing all that will basically do all of these things that they say that they need side chains for. Yeah. We can do complex transactions. We can do blinding. We can um, um, basically do mast or tree signatures and far more. And we don't need to have side chains to do it. We don't need to artificially push people off. And that, of course, is the reason they limited the block cap. Because if you limit the block cap, you have to go and use one of their side chains. Yeah. If you don't have a block cap, 
then why would you pay money to use a side chain when you can do it on Bitcoin? Yes. So, I mean, it's cheating in a way. So it's a forced competition. Then, um, personally, the first real clutch in Bitcoin was pay to script hash, um, which is terrible in itself. Um, if you're looking at birthday collisions and things like this, right now Google have already gotten up to 77.2 average uh, ability to crack ripe MD. And ripe 160 only has one, uh, has half that number of uh, bits of security when you're looking at birthday collision uh, type attacks. Mm -hmm. And that means we're within one to three years of pay to script hash being totally useless. It'll be economic first and it will cost money to break. Um, but the reality is it came about so that people could put non-standard scripts back into Bitcoin. Mm. So if we don't need to fight and try and hide non-standard scripts, we don't need pay to script hash. And that kludge helped lead the way to segregated witness, which is, another form of instead of chain of digital signatures a chain of hashes and a chain of hashes are less secure than a chain of digital signatures. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm hoping to see a secure growing Bitcoin, not a, what pledge can we put next so that we can force people off to side chains, Bitcoin. There's no reason for that. We're going to grow Bitcoin the way it was meant to be. And that's on chain. That's on chain. Mm. You know you're safe when you're on chain. Yeah, because some people, um, you know, by taking taking that work off chain, um, it's essentially not Bitcoin anymore. I, I, is that correct? Or can you still have off chain solutions um, and that still be considered Bitcoin? You can have off chain solutions that you settle on Bitcoin. Um, an example of some of the things you could do would be allowing um, updates and exchange using thresholds. Okay. Now, there are, there are ways of doing thresholded exchange so that um, uh, we could have a key that is split between various people and the thresholds could be updated so that only the new thresholds work. Uh, but the old ones no longer work because uh, it won't go into exactly how that's going to happen. That'll be coming out next year. Yep. Um, that then allows for um, the ability to exchange off chain or also do group signatures. And doing that allows a level of anonymity as well. So if we got a, mm -hmm. a board and we need a three or five vote or a four or five vote, we don't necessarily know who voted and didn't. So if I vote, then I don't know who didn't vote, for instance. Yep, gotcha. Um, Lightning Network, you know, there was a video that was going around over the last couple of days, right? Which I, I thought was quite interesting. Um, what are your thoughts on the Lightning Network? Okay. Um, for anyone old enough to remember the um, Total Recall movie, the original one with Arnie, there was a scene where he pa uh, came into Mars and um, um, had his sort of face thing break down and he's sitting there going, two weeks two weeks <laughs> yeah. um lightning is like that it's 18 months 18 months so two years ago it was 18 months and in 18 years it's going to be 18 months <laughs> yep. completely missed how bitcoin works bitcoin is near complete mm. it's it, it exceeds what you have connectivity wise for a small world Basically, you hit one node and the next hop, every node in the network practically has the transaction. In a mesh, it jumps from node to node to node to node to node to node. Yep. So, um, an example of how small worlds start working is um, in a loose connection for a small world, not, not a um, near complete one. Mm. We have Facebook. Now, we used to have this thing six degrees of Kevin Bacon. And the world used to be connected by at most six hops. Do you know what, how many hops there are now because of Facebook? How many? Uh, 3.5 to 4. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That, yeah, that makes Every, sense. Yeah. 
Um, every person on earth is now connected by a maximum of four hops, even including those who aren't on Facebook. Wow. Yeah. And you know, I actually see this on uh, LinkedIn as well. Like usually I think I only need to go, to get to people that I want to connect with. Um, I only usually need to go to my second degree contacts. Mm. Um, very okay. rarely, yeah, do I even need to go to my third degree um, connections. And I've never seen a fourth degree connection um, on LinkedIn. Yeah. And so that's what's happening in the world. We're becoming more densely connected. Now, when you look at things like um, Lightning, what they're, they're looking at is a loose mesh. They're thinking about how the internet has worked. Now, how the internet... Oh, sorry. That's just me. I'm just uh, bringing up a visual <laughs> while you're talking. Um, okay. about this small world network stuff. <laughs> yeah. So over time, what we're going to see is people more and more connected. Now, loose mesh type networks are where we have problems. Mm. Now, the internet started as a loose mesh, and that's how things developed. But the idea of peer-to-peer -peer is to move away from that and allow better connectivity. Mm. Now. As we develop and have bigger systems, it's going to become easier. Mm. Now, loose mesh systems always have um, centralized nodes. If you look at the internet, you have the main BGP hubs, and there are always attack points where you can take out a lot of the internet with a small number of attacks. Mm. But that's because they're modeling how things used to be. Mm. They've, they've looked at the old way of, of routing, and their problem is they've abandoned the key fundamentals of Bitcoin, the peer-to-peer -peer nature, thinking that you need to create many hops and um, incorporate people mm. running everything themselves. But yeah. the internet even doesn't work because everyone has their own uh, web cache or their own everything else. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. It's taking to just fail to understand how things really work. Yep. And you know, this is, we, we hear this all the time um, on Twitter and I hear you uh, constantly having to defend and teach people <laughs> um, about this, which I think has been actually quite, quite good because um, I've noticed, and you, you've said this before that, you know, you were going to start to come out with more information um, around how this all works. And I think people are starting to see that. And, you know, if you manage to, to block or remove all the trolls, you find that you can actually have some quite civil um, discussions, Please. right? Um, and at, there was a question uh, from the community as, as well. I, I got some questions from uh, our community on Facebook, and one of them was around trolling. So uh, that, that question goes, trolling seems to be a common thing on the internet, uh, unfortunately, especially in the Bitcoin community. Uh, how did you feel the first time you started getting trolled by people on the internet? And then how did you eventually learn how to deal with them? Oh, um, I can't say that I handle everything too well and um, <laughs> um, made my life harder by just shutting everything down and mm. um, deleting all my Twitter and my everything else and, and yeah. just leaving. Um, over time, I'm <laughs> thick skinned. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've stopped caring. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's gain and there's loss for everything like this. And so, yep. And um, for every time you gain, you lose something at the same time, but uh, mm. um, it's a thick skin, thick skin, thick skin. Definitely. All right. So that's, you know, that's advice to those uh, people out there. And I think anyone who's kind of gained the following anyways, right. Um, who've had more people with their eyes on them. This is probably how a lot of celebrities feel. You know, you can never make everyone happy. You know, um, eventually you just ha have to sort of phase out um, a lot of the criticisms because you end up becoming a, a target of insecurity for a lot of folks as well. Uh, next question uh, from the community. This is from Nish. Uh, I said, I know you guys have tested 1 million, um, he's put TPS, so transactions per second, and it works fine. But when, does, when do you think it will be rolled out on Bitcoin Cash exactly? Well, Bitcoin Cash is going to scale up to 32 meg uh, in the new year. Yeah. And even then, this is not the same as uh, Bitcoin SegWit has. It's not mm. sort of a 
book, people can easily adjust and change that. Yep. And as we get to more and more adoption in the new year, which a lot of things are going to happen that I can't talk about yet, um, we're going to keep that cap way above where it's going to be. I mean, mm. the idea of a cap uh, is really uh, just for spam control. And the original idea, if you look at the code, and it's even commented in there, is that yeah. spam control uh, was by flood control, like flood-based. So you mm. have a number of free transactions, then you have some paid ones, and then you have more expensive paid ones. Mm. And, but you don't stop anyone. And if someone wants to chuck money at you that is um, at a rate higher than hard drive costs as a yeah. miner, then take it. And why is it so hard or difficult for people to understand why the um, the one megabyte cap is detrimental in the long run. And, you know, I hear some folks use the example of a highway, right? And, you know, say a highway with five lanes, after it gets completely full and congested, um, usually you think of, you know, widening the highway. Um, is that a right analogy? Or is there something that, you know, people are missing? <laughs> it's completely what people are missing. Yeah. Um, highway is a typical um, two-dimensional structure. Mm. And what we're talking about is Bitcoin is full and the on and off ramps are full. Um, what we're doing in scaling and removing that is imagine that we now have um, sort of flying cars. There's going sure. to be a service starting in, in Dubai next year, actually, with um, these personnel drones mm. and uh, here in London in 2019 and, and slowly from there. Now, when you start thinking, what happens when you not only scale the road out, but you can scale it up mm. and you can have different layers. So now instead of being able to fit a hundred thousand layer uh, people going at a time in the morning, we can fit a hundred billion and mm. suddenly we have no bottlenecks. If yeah. it's yeah, no bottleneck here, you, you're fine. That's what we're going to do. Now the, lie that we keep being told is that everyone's meant to run a node. SPP, more than enough. Miners are full nodes, full stop. Ah, sorry, for those, for those who aren't familiar with SPV, uh, can you please explain what that stands for, what it is? I will explain SPV in a second um, and get back to it. But yep. the, the concept is you need competing entities trying to settle blocks. And miners create blocks. If you're not mining, you're not creating a block. Now, there is a reason to run a, a node if you're not mining. And that is if you have zero comp transactions and you want to ensure that you um, understand the UTXO well enough to be able to handle uh, and know probabilistically your chance of being um, defrauded or not and be able to offer people uh, low value, even $300, pounds, whatever else type transactions quickly in seconds. That's why you have nodes. Now, this idea that um, you need to run a node at home, it doesn't matter what your node says. It's mm -hmm. a consensus system. It matters what everyone else's node says. So you're saying, I can validate my transaction, means nothing. Mm -hmm. You care that other people can validate your transaction. Bitcoin mm -hmm. works not because you validate something, but because all those miners validate something. So it doesn't matter if your node says you have money. It matters if they say you have money. Now, mm. that's where SPV means uh, becomes important. As a user, you need to be able to check that um, you're included. And you don't need to check all the history. You just need to know that you're in the UTXO set and um, you're valid. Now, SPP is a simplified payment uh, verification scheme where it enables you to have a cut down miner and uh, sorry cut down wallet not miner node and then send and receive and and be able to interact now as long as you control your keys you're safe and even with a web wallet if you controlled your keys you're safe mm. the difficulty of course is if you control your keys you can lose them yeah it seems that's to be why, happening a lot. <laughs> that's why 
uh, we've spent a lot of time working on blinding thresholds, um, the threshold blinding schemes, etc. So that in uh, what we're going to be bringing out in 2018 will be threshold key systems, not just like Shamir, completely dealerless ones, and ones where uh, at no point someone can steal your keys. But at the same time, you can have escrow services and protection. You can even have that blinded so that people protecting your keys don't even know what they're protecting hmm. and can't engage yeah. anything. Now, that allows for a significant level of um, protection while still having all the benefits of a web wallet. If the web wallet can't do a mountain gox on you and run off with your keys yeah. or lose your money, then you're safe. If that web wallet disappears, you can still import your keys somewhere else. Yeah then it doesn't matter anymore. If you have 100% control of your keys and 100% control of the signing of your transactions and the web wallet offers you a service, then it no longer matters. All that matters is that you are safe and you can move anytime you want. They can't force you to stay. They can't stop you getting your keys out. You always know that you have 100% of your Bitcoin there. Um, you don't need to worry whether their little pool is adequate or not because you control your keys, you control your Bitcoin. Mm. And that's the change we're going to start seeing on all this. Mm. That's, a, that's a good segue into um, another one of our community members' questions. Uh, so this is from Britt Delange. Uh, she says, people say banks uh, will be obsolete. Do you think banks will still have a role in the system in, say, 10 years' time? If so, what role? And even if it's technically possible, do you believe the social and political structures around finance will change enough? The banks will be there. Central banks are what Bitcoin really causes big problems for. Yeah. Now, banks will be there because banks are not depositories. People mm. keep getting this wrong. Mm. Banks are not just where you put your savings. When you take money out, and you have a loan on your credit card, which is what it is, at Christmas. That's a bank function. Mm. When you have housing loans, that's a bank function. Mm. And peer-to-peer -peer can do certain things. But then you have reputation systems that we don't have yet. Yeah. We have good systems. We have equity systems. So banks will exist, but not the same way. We're mm. going to see radical disruption and change. Um, I can't tell you what banks will look like in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you they'll look different. Yep. yep. So, but the reason finance is so big globally is that basically finance is the allocation of equity to where it needs to be. Mm. That's going to change. Now, it's not like people, people think small as well, and they think about their own situation but they don't think what else needs to be occurring in this world. So if we start thinking um, in Bangladesh, there are, I believe, estimated 40 trillion US dollars worth of uh, civil projects that people want to do over the next decade. Yeah. That requires funding. Yep. So you can try and tax people and take money away. And the, then you have the problem that you have misalignment of funds, you have corruption, you have everything else that comes with um, taxation, the way that we work it now. Mm. You can have um, an enhanced lighthouse protocol where people in an area and businesses and everything like that vote to, to have something built. Um, all sorts of things. It, it's going to change drastically. Mm. But um, if you want to build a bridge, that's money. Some bridges here in Britain cost a billion dollars mm. and people don't think um, how this sort of comes about. In, in the US, if you think about some of the bridges between um, uh, Manhattan and, and the mainland, they're phenomenally expensive. They don't mm. just appear and they have to be financed. So how do you finance? So Bitcoin changes how you do finance, mm. but it doesn't remove the need for finance. Mm. And that's a good it, distinction. It changes central banking. It means it doesn't make central banking go away. That's another thing people got wrong. Yeah. 
you can be a central bank with Bitcoin. The difference is you don't get to be a fractional reserve central bank with Bitcoin. Mm. So as an example, a government could, in the good times, save money so that when there is a bad time, they can spend down on their holdings. Mm. So on top of that, they can still take out loans so they can top up the amount of Bitcoin they have by taking a loan from another country. Now, the difference here is it's completely transparent. Mm. No one knows how much US dollar currency actually exists right at the moment. Yeah. Even the Americans don't know how much currency they have, which is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, US Fed can't tell you how much money is actually out there. They can give you estimates. That's the best they can do. Um, and so when you get to a scenario where there are estimates about a country knowing how much it has because they've printed so much in the past, they have no idea, you have problems. That's crazy. Um, another good segue into uh, a question from Tom Huffman. What will be the effect of American money laundering laws on the crypto space? Uh, Senate is currently holding sessions on updating uh, those laws. No. Oh. <laughs> More reporting, yep. um, but um, I think they, they're going to find more and more people start uh, pushing back against some of these laws. Mm. Uh, crypto is a way of giving people the way to push back. Yeah. Now, um, I'm here in London, so which I, I love because I can just pop across the puddle and um, there's Spain and there's France and yeah. there's Germany and everything like that. There's so many places close. Mm. Australia, you do the same trip and you're still in the same state. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's> so true. <laughs> um, with a whole lot of empty space in the middle. <laughs> yep. Now, I mean, been to Spain a few times this year, and one of the things um, that shocked me the first time I went there is the limits they have on cash. Mm. In Spain, they've made it a criminal offence to take out too much cash. Wow. So um, you can't take out, you can't make purchases now on more than um, uh, two or two and a half thousand euros. You have to do it online and the bank has to then do a bank transfer to another bank and all sorts of fun things to uh, basically control the economy. So mm. it is crazy. And that's the whole point. Mm. And this is because they're getting into a situation where they're nearly grease really. Yeah. Um, uh, they're the next basket case with everyone else, not because the people, but because the government. And if you mm. keep promising and trying to deliver more than you can actually earn, eventually you have to pay the piper. Mm. And that's Greece's problem. They want to buy their way into um, uh, sort of favors and keep handing things out and mm. not realize that, well, eventually you have to pay people. You Eventually you have to devalue currency. And if you're, you're going to keep doing this with euros. You're going to have problems. Yeah, exactly. Um, got a, a, a question. Next question is from uh, Richard Turner. He asks, what do you feel are the greatest challenges to um, Bitcoin? We'll call it Satoshi's Bitcoin uh, in reaching its full potential. Oh, well, scaling is not a challenge. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Easy one. Um, what we need is education and getting this out there to the majority of people in the world. Mm. It's going to be difficult to build a robust ecosystem because we need something that isn't, I mean, we can't just run and grab everything. It's not that sort of community. It's not yeah. that sort of system. For money to work, it can't be a block stream type central company running everything. Yeah. So we have to find a distributed corporate model, something that mm. doesn't really exist yet. Mm. So Enchain has to try and build without owning. It's a strange scenario. We have yeah. to be we have to be capitalists without being a traditional, as Peter Thiel would say, monopolist. Hmm. We fail if we become that. We have to mm. open things so that everyone else builds. We win when 
the community is robust. Yeah. So, um, we have now new parts of our corporation that are going to be um, sort of becoming public next year. Um, we have uh, N-Chain Reaction and uh, whatever else, uh, which is going to be an investment arm. So we're going to start actually giving money to help develop the community in a big way. Yep. So we're going to start people who are uh, developing new solutions and ensuring that they can, giving them the equity they need to succeed. So, uh, yeah, we, we uh, go through the normal spiel. No, we're not going to list or we're not looking for investors. No, we don't. <laughs> money um etc etc sorry we're not sharing that part of it we're not sharing if you want to share mm. then we share by helping you build something in alignment with us make bitcoin cash better mm. so that's our job we have a really strange sort of corporate model now where our role is to help others mm. develop what we've been doing to give them the opportunity to be in the next Facebook, to be making the next Twitter, to be etc. So that's what we're trying to, that's our job. Our job is to find these other budding enterprises and build them into something huge mm. without us being them. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. Um, are you familiar with the Bitcoin Cash Fund that uh, has kind of popped up over the last couple of weeks? I yes, I've seen it. That's a great idea. Yeah. So are those the sort of things that uh, we need more of um, in the ecosystem? Um, that, but um, uh, an example hmm. of something would be yours. Yours. Yes. New, yes. Um, new startup that's um, basing itself on Bitcoin Cash. Uh, many other things. We want to try and take a lot of different ideas and develop them. So yep. um, we've got all of that being set up at the moment, yep. um, all underway. And we want to take people who will basically create the new global ecosystem and help them do it. Beautiful. Um, all right. We've got a couple questions left um, because I know you're doing, uh, giving us your time here and thank you so much for it. Uh, but we got, one from uh, Nish again, and this one I think has to do with the micro uh, payments. So how do you believe Bitcoin Cash will be used for micro payments in the future? That is, will all items on the menu at the coffee shop be in BCH and fiat removed completely or simply pegged against fiat and BCH is simply the payment gateway, i.e. a coffee might cost 0 0.0004 BCH at one day, then 0 0.00035 BCH next, but both equivalent to $3. If the latter, what incentive would people have to spend their BCH if it's still acting like this? That's okay. a very long-winded question. <laughs> so all of the above. We're going to go where people peg things to fear for a while. Yep. And then over time, that will change. Now, all we need to do, though, is allow you to spend and buy back. Bitcoin legacy has restricted that because of fees. I can't go and buy a coffee and have my account topped up because the fees are too much. With Bitcoin Cash, I can pay under a cent. So I can walk in there, I can spend my Bitcoin Cash, and when if I've got fiat in a bank account, it can auto top up. If I have um, money coming in from my, my, um, my sort of um, fortnightly or monthly pay, I can top up. So I can spend my cash and top it up straight away. Mm. That'll be part of what happens. So that way I get the benefits of both. Yeah. I can spend and also have the benefits. Now, why will this happen? Well, for a start, it's cheaper than Visa. Visa is 3% uh, plus or minus. Mm. That's a, a large differential for many businesses. Uh, if you look at um, somewhere like Tesco, Tesco don't even make 3% profit. Mm. Their margins are that low and fine. So 3% is a large amount for someone like that. Yeah. Now, over time, 
as we see more and more use and we see more globalization, then people are going to start thinking more in terms of Bitcoin. Yeah. And as they think more in terms of Bitcoin, then the thought process will move towards Bitcoin Cash. Mm. Now, one of the, the things people argue is we won't ever do this, the market for lemons type scenario, which is the argument you're using. Mm. Um, and Akloff got his Nobel Prize for it, except mm. for one little problem. It's wrong. Mm. Empirically, the actual example he gave with cars is wrong completely utterly wrong the empirical evidence showed zero significance to Akerlof's claims there's no uh, people actually uh, don't have this um, information asymmetry the way that he he said um, signaling occurs as an example of how it doesn't uh, fall down that and computers are a perfect case in point mm. if you hold your money Every year, you can buy a better computer. Why would you buy a computer ever when next year it will be better? So you can invest your cash and not upgrade your computer. And next year, it will be um, twice as big and powerful and cheaper. Mm. And the year after that, and the year after that. And I had a digital rainbow back in 1985 which was like a $20,000 brick, huge thing, tower case, everything like that. Uh, eventually I saved up and uh, spent huge amounts of money and got a five, uh, five megabyte hard drive, mm. uh, which was a five and a quarter full size thing. Yeah. Um, it made whirring sounds that sounded like a blender. <laughs> and the hard drive alone cost $20,000. Right. So, and it had a Hercules graphics card, um, that did extended CGA and well for forty thousand dollars if I'd invested that etc cetera, etc cetera, in a normal um, share return type portfolio in a few years I could have way better except that's a stupid argument mm. we have to live now we have to buy things now yeah we can't everyone I mean the fallacy of that argument is but you can buy Bitcoin with your fiat. So why would you leave any fiat? There's my question for you. If you're going to follow that argument, why are you going out there and buying a coffee at all? Because you could put that money towards more Bitcoin. Mm. Why are you buying a bigger house? Because you could put that money towards more Bitcoin. Mm. Why are you going out to a restaurant? Because you can put that money right now towards more Bitcoin. Yep. That's the argument when you actually take it to its logical conclusion. Mm. Why am I buying that book and enjoying myself? Because in 10 years time, I could have 20 books for that 50. Yeah. So except there's this time scarcity too. Yeah. I've only got so much life left. Um, I'm 47 now. And um, I understand that I'll live longer than um, previous generations and everything like that because the world's technology has developed and all the rest. But mm. uh, I would rather have more life than more old. Yeah. And I, don't, I know what people say, but I'd rather have more life now than I would, even if it allows me to extend from 90 to 95. Mm. I want to live it now. Yeah. And people want yeah. to live their life now. So why would I do this? For the simple fact that you're doing it now. Every time you make a purchase using fiat for something other than Bitcoin, you are deciding to spend Bitcoin. Mm. In a way, you have that choice right now. Every dollar you get can go into Bitcoin, except you don't. Mm. Every time you have a restaurant meal, instead of sitting at home with um, um, a thing of pot noodles, <laughs> yeah. you're spending your Bitcoin. Mm. Every time you go out to a pub and have a night out with the mates, Bitcoin. 
every time you go to a gym rather than just jog and um, do push-ups and and do whatever else mm. spending your bitcoin mm. so it's a really bad argument when you actually start logically pulling it apart mm. well i'm glad that you have just now because <laughs> that will give a lot of people food for thought now <laughs> um all right we've got uh three three questions left um mm -hmm. The dilution of Bitcoin, you know, we're talking about the importance of education, right? There's a lot of confusion between the different forks of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash being the first fork, right? But now we've got Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Diamond. I think someone's wanting to create Bitcoin Cash Plus in January, uh, Bitcoin Platinum. Um, what problems do you foresee there uh, with all this happening in terms of our efforts to get Satoshi's Bitcoin, you know, reaching its full potential? Most of these, if you look at um, like Adam Back's comments about Bitcoin gold and whatever else, they promote everything but Bitcoin cash. Yeah. And from um, sort of their little inputs and, and whatever else, they're the people behind most of these things. This is how do we attack Bitcoin cash? We try and dilute the name. Mm. There's one Bitcoin, there's one vision. Now, this idea of forks, well, there is one fork mm -hmm. and that is the people who went off and added SegWit and radically changed Bitcoin from what it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. And we're going along the original path. Yeah. People will see that in time. Yep. Awesome. Uh, final two questions. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are more general. What does success mean for you, Craig? Five billion people using Bitcoin on a daily basis beautiful it's rich people because rich people don't need bitcoin mm. i don't need bitcoin anymore mm. i can transact globally anytime i want mm. my rich people problems are stupid things <laughs> no one gets about mm. mine are um uh, hopefully my wife won't hear this but buying her <laughs> christmas present and yeah. having the the bank um, blocked my card saying a fraudulent transaction. Mm. Uh, well, you've never bought one of those before. And <laughs> it's one of these things that you never buy like two of. Yeah. So um, generally speaking, I had that argument with them. If I bought six of these, that would be strange, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. And how do people buy one of them? Oh, probably once. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So Bitcoin doesn't have that problem because mm. you spend your money, you spend your money. There's no having to do fraud detection or uh, monitoring what the hell you're doing. Mm. Rich people problems in Bitcoin don't really matter. Poor people problems matter. Yeah. People who don't have control of their own money, people who have to cash their paycheck um, and need it done quickly and lose sometimes 30% of everything they earn matter. Um, if you look at people who um, get complained about talking about migration, people who cross border and maybe do illegal fruit picking or whatever else type work, they lose large amounts of their money because at present they're taken advantage of everywhere. Yeah. Because they don't have any um, protection by government, um, everything they do is freaking screwed. Yeah. So they're the people who need Bitcoin. I really don't care about people who um, uh, have lots. Mm. They, can, they can hire people to do stuff on their own. Mm. The people who need help and need protecting and need Bitcoin, they're the ones we want to do things with. Beautiful. Um, final question. I love asking everybody this. If you could be any animal in the world, what would you be and why? Um, human. <laughs> <laughs> Should I ask why? <laughs> uh, because we have thought, creation, everything else. What yep. the hell else would you want to be? <laughs> Oh, uh, probably one of the uh, wisest and most fitting answers uh, for you, Craig. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. I, I hope folks uh, have learned a lot from this or will learn a lot from this. 
And yeah, you know, I'm a big supporter of, of Bitcoin Cash as well. And I look forward to seeing, you know, the, those 5 billion people using Satoshi's uh, Bitcoin as well. So thank you for all your work. Wonderful. Thank you. All right.